When it comes to the cost of living, the good news this week was that interest rates didn't go up. The bad news, they won't be coming down anytime soon. The Reserve Bank Governor has made it very clear there'll be no relief for mortgage holders until next year at the earliest. Inflation is still too high. And one of the main reasons, according to the RBA, is what's called public demand. That's state and federal government spending. And of course, this is clearly not what Labor wanted to hear. It's been arguing for months that its budget is helping in the fight against inflation. And the Prime Minister, well, he's showing no signs of hitting the brakes when it comes to government spending. In fact, he's just announced $3.6 billion to fund an increase in childcare workers' pay. So what's going on in the economy? What did we learn this week? And what does it mean for the cost of living? And are the Reserve Bank and the government both on the same page when it comes to what's actually driving inflation? I'm David Spears on Ngunnawal Country at Parliament House in Canberra. Welcome to Insiders on Background. Well, Lucy Ellis spent more than 30 years at the Reserve Bank, including six years as the Assistant Governor. She left last year to become Westpac's Chief Economist. Lucy Ellis, welcome. Great to talk to you. Thanks, David. Great look, to be here. And look, I'm, I'm particularly um, uh, interested in hearing your thoughts because you probably understand better than most the thinking of the Reserve Bank, uh, why the governor is, governor is saying what she's saying about no cuts for another six months or so. I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that the, the decision to keep rates on hold was expected, but it is this line that she gave, uh, Michelle Bullock, about no rate cuts for another six months that uh, was perhaps not expected. Why do you think she said this? It's a great question. In the media release after the state, after the meeting, it was actually said that the board wasn't ruling anything in or out. But then in the media conference, the governor said that rate cuts this year didn't align with the board's thinking at the current moment. So there is a bit of a proviso at the current moment, but the way we interpret it is that if things turn out as the board expects, then you won't see rate cuts until February. Mm. Now, you know, while I might have been there for 30 years, we had previously been expecting that they might see their way to clear to start cutting rates in November, and we've had to push our expectations back to February because of this language. The Reserve Bank is taking a very hawkish view of current demand conditions relative to some other observers, and that's going to influence their decisions over coming months. I mean, just as a, a side point here, the whole idea of forward guidance from the Reserve Bank was, of course, uh, frowned upon after her predecessor, Philip Lowe, gave that forward guidance um, you know, that rates would stay at record lows until for a couple of years, and then, of course, they had to dramatically change course and start lifting rates repeatedly, and he was really burnt by all of that. I, I noticed Michelle Bullock, you know, when she said this, she said this is not forward guidance, but it but it kind of is, isn't it? I mean, and, and is, that, is that dangerous for a Reserve Bank governor? I think the way she couched it, that it didn't align with the board's current thinking, mm. does give her a bit of an out if things turn out differently from what they expect. One of the things we need to be mindful of is that their forecasts were actually finalised on the 31st of July. And so that was actually before we saw that weaker labour market data come out of the US and a lot of views about the path of the global economy weakened significantly. Now, the market reaction uh, to that, at least the initial reaction, was pretty overblown and, and mm. market pricing has come back since then. But that was material information about the state of the US economy and the global economy and their forecasts don't allow for that. They would have been aware of the market movements but they downplayed them quite a lot. So this so data out of the US strengthens the case for a rate cut, but that came in too late for what they'd already put in their forecasts. I don't think it's enough to nudge their hand. I think it solidifies mm. our view, which we've had for a long time, that the Fed will start cutting at its September meeting. But there are a lot of other elements in the governor's communication and in the statement on monetary policy that says that the Reserve Bank has developed a way of thinking about the economy that has put them into a very hawkish state of mind. Mm. I mean, our forecasts at Westpac for what we call trimmed mean inflation, so the underlying rate of inflation that abstracts from all the uh, extreme values, all the, the, the bumps and, and lumps, that's the one that the Reserve Bank focuses on. And our forecasts for trimmed mean inflation 
are exactly the same as theirs. So we have a very similar view of the economy and what the RBA is trying to achieve, but they're thinking that they won't be raising, you know, they won't be cutting rates until next year, even though policy does operate with a lag and you do actually have to start cutting rates before you hit the target. Mm. And I think that what what that says to us is that the Reserve Bank doesn't have a lot of conviction about its forecasts. It's still really worried that inflation won't come down as they think. Uh, they've come to the conclusion that we're somehow different from our peer economies and not just because you know, the Reserve Bank did choose to have uh, not quite as high for a bit longer strategy in order to hold on to the gains in employment that we've seen in Australia. They've obviously just now developed a view, particularly around productivity, that is a lot more hawkish and a lot more pessimistic around inflation uh, than we thought that the data really validated. So th this is interesting. You're, you're both seeing the same trajectory on inflation, particularly underlying inflation, the important one. But you reckon the, the Reserve Bank isn't as confident about those numbers? That's our read right. of uh, their statements. And looking at the statement on monetary policy, you can see that they also have a very pessimistic view on productivity, which is part, part of the reason why they lack the conviction around that central mm. forecast for inflation. And so uh, yeah, yeah. they think that inflation is going to come down but they're not sure enough for them to think that, okay, nervous. yeah. Yeah, and I might come back to this productivity question, but just generally, can you understand a lot of people who are really, you know, feeling this, the squeeze of, of cost of living, thinking where on earth is this um, strength in the economy coming from? Because I'm not feeling it. Why is the Reserve Bank being so hawkish and keep, you know, not, not giving us a rate cut? Uh, we're absolutely um, crushed at the moment. Where is the, the heat in the economy that the Reserve Bank is worried about? Absolutely people will be feeling it at the moment. And we see this amongst our own customers, at least some of them, and we're seeing it in our, our own consumer sentiment survey. Consumers mm. are really, really feeling the pinch. But that's the per capita economy. That's the per person economy. And one of the things that has boosted uh, the Reserve Bank's view of overall demand is that population growth has been really strong. So even though individuals are feeling a pinch, there are more people. And so that means the economy is overall larger, demand is stronger. And again, because of this very pessimistic view about productivity, uh, the Reserve Bank has assessed that the supply capacity in the Australian economy to deliver that demand is less than what they thought mm. uh, three months ago or six months ago. Just on the data that you see, I mean, you, you obviously spent a long time at the Reserve Bank, you know, at Westpac. Who, who gets the best data? Do you, do you, at, uh, you know, a big bank like Westpac get to see information that the Reserve Bank doesn't or, or vice versa? Does the Reserve Bank get really good intel that no one else gets? It's both. Um, at a big commercial bank like Westpac, we do have the benefit of data that we see from our own customers. We publish a card tracker that gives you an early read on consumer spending. We do see a lot in our own, uh, you know, in our own business, in our, in our own book, as well as uh, just talking to customers. I mean, the ability to go out and, and talk to some of the, you know, the biggest companies, some of the largest state governments, uh, and, you know, many people across the, you know, the non-profit sector, as well as what's happening with our individual customers and small business customers, you know, that's gold. Mm. But the Reserve Bank, as being part of the public sector, also can see data that we can't see. So they get to see what's happening in the single touch payroll from the ATO. They get to see the individual data out of the labour force survey, which is why they can compile and report an average household size that's very timely. Mm. So they, uh, they have their own liaison program as well. So each of us gets data that the other doesn't get and then there's a big overlap of data that we both get. Yeah, it's interesting. I've always wondered about that. Look, when it comes to the drivers of inflation, one thing the Reserve Bank is certainly um, pointing to is public demand, as I mentioned, state and federal government spending. It doesn't get you know too much more specific than that. It looks at the aggregate, it says. Um, how much of an issue is that at the moment, this, this government spending generally? Well, as the Governor said in her media conference earlier in the week, 
the fundamental issue is the balance of aggregate demand versus aggregate supply. And as I mentioned, they've already assessed that aggregate supply is weaker than what they thought. And so any extra demand that they identify is excess aggregate demand. So whether that comes from the public sector or from consumers or from business investment or somewhere else, it still adds up to aggregate demand being stronger yeah. than what aggregate supply can deliver. And that's their fundamental analysis. It's all about the level. And so at the moment they assess that, that you know, the extra that they didn't know about before is coming from public demand. They did upgrade their public demand forecasts uh, in their latest forecast round. They do have a very strong outlook for public demand growth in the current year. Um, and presumably, given that the Secretary of Treasury is on their board, they may have, again, a window into that that, mm. you know, you can't see from the private sector. But, you know, it was a very bullish outlook for public demand in their forecast. And does, does that mean governments are to blame in part for inflation staying too high for too long? There are a range of things going on and strong demand from one quarter would be adding to that. I think I'd particularly... Uh, point to what's going on in the construction industry. We've had this big surge in population growth after the borders reopened. That means there are a lot more people wanting somewhere to live. That's putting pressure on rents, but it's also putting pressure on uh, housing supply. And so the cost of home building has remained strong, even as some of the supply chain issues that happened during the pandemic have rolled over. So construction costs are still incredibly strong. And one of the things that is driving that is that, you know, builders can build houses or they can you know, work on infrastructure projects. So to the extent that there are infrastructure spending plans that are bunching uh, a lot of demand for construction work altogether, well, that would be adding to things. Mm. But fundamentally, you know, we have low unemployment, we don't have a lot of spare capacity. And so the Reserve Bank is identifying that any additional dollar of demand uh, does matter relative to their, as I said, very pessimistic assessment of supply. Yeah, this is an interesting point about construction. I mean, we, we spoke last week on this podcast to um, the CEO of the Grattan Institute, uh, Aruna Sathanapalli, and she made the point that maybe we do need to slow down some of those big infrastructure projects so more of the workers can start building homes. Um, would you agree that, 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 that this is something that needs to be considered? Well, some of that infrastructure is infrastructure that you need for homes. I mean, mm. you can't build new homes without the roads water and pipes that, yeah. and roads and electricity connections. So we need to be mindful of that as well. But fundamentally, what we're hearing from our customers in the construction and property development and building materials space is that the cost of construction is just so high that at the moment, a lot of housing development projects are unviable. Mm, mm. And there's only so many workers. Um, I mean, sure, if we can try and train up more, we could import more uh, foreign builders. But you know, if there's a finite number of workers, that's going to push up the cost for everyone. That's right. Um, but it's not just about the workers. It's it's also about you know the processes, yeah. the building materials, and it just seems to be that you know these very complicated supply chains. You mm. know you've got to put the roads in, you've got to put the water in, you've got to get the concrete truck to you know do the foundations. There's a lot of moving parts to any building project, mm. and it just seems to be that the you know to be fair, there is productivity issues in that sector. That's a long-standing issue. It's something that was true pre-COVID as well. And it just seems to be the case that that is now run up against more demand, partly from government infrastructure mm. spending, but also from the fact that we just had a sudden rush in population over 2023 and into 2024. So when it comes to what we saw in the, the budget, the energy bill relief, other cost of living help, that's temporary uh, time limited. What did we learn from the Reserve Bank this week about how they're viewing that government support, whether it's actually going to help or not in the fight against inflation? Well, those rebates were designed to reduce measured inflation uh, in the hope that, again, there wouldn't be a, a, a rate hike. So they did, the government did structure uh, that. Uh, electricity bill relief in a way that would reduce reported headline inflation. Now, yes, it's temporary. I, I 
do want to sort of highlight a few things about that. Firstly, it's not a small amount of, you know, it's not, it's not a big amount of money, uh, but it is extra dollar, dollars in people's pockets that they would otherwise be spending on their electricity bills. Hmm. In principle, that does add a little bit to demand. Against that, there are some offsets. There are only partial offsets, but they are some offsets. One of the things I think a lot of people haven't appreciated about our current inflation is just how many prices are just marked on whatever inflation was last year. So even if it's a bit of a, a trick to reduce measured inflation this year, that does mean that those prices don't rise as much next year. So it does help a little bit at the margin next year. You mean all sorts year. of payments that are pegged to the inflation rate are, are going to be a little bit lower because of that you know, artificial exactly forcing right. down of the, uh, of the headline rate? That's exactly right. So, I mean, look, this would be the big political argument, no doubt, until uh, to the election. Is the government helping or hurting in the fight against inflation? It sounds like you're saying it's, it's, it's a complicated <laughs> picture. Yeah, the rebates are actually relatively small in the scheme of things. My, my recollection mm. is that the total amount they're spending is about $3 billion, mm. which is a lot when you're an individual and you're thinking about how much $3, million, $3 billion is. Yeah, but in terms of the total spending, economy, it's yeah, small. Is, is total government spending, though, a problem? Is it still too high? I think we need to reflect on what the appropriate size of government is, what the appropriate timing of infrastructure projects is. And we just have to reflect if we had such a big increase in population because of this, you know, borders being closed, then borders opening, everybody turning up in a rush, we really need to reflect on, well, that does mean we need to build more houses. It does mean we need more roads and schools and, you know, water pipes. Uh, and so, you know, the governments are caught in a bind on this. They do actually have to you know, deliver mm. infrastructure for a growing population. So you've got some sympathy for the spending that we're seeing? I think we need to think about the timing mm. of some of the projects. And certainly some state governments have rescheduled projects that they could, mm. where they could do it. But in a lot of cases, these are projects that are already underway. They're multi-year projects. You kind of can't stop the train or the tunnel uh, once it started. Look, an another bit of government spending that we saw um, this week, we're recording this uh, Thursday afternoon, it's it's just been announced by the Prime Minister, $3.6 billion over a couple of years to boost the pay of childcare workers by a total of 15%. Everyone would agree they don't earn enough. Um, uh, the Prime Minister argues this will attract more people back to the sector, that'll help expand it, that'll have a productivity dividend because uh, more parents will be able to get back into the workforce. What do you think? Is there any sort of inflationary impact or is this a good idea, a good investment? On the inflation side, we firstly need to ask how much of that additional subsidy just gets built into the price of mm. childcare. That's been the typical uh, pattern that we've seen over many years mm. in any sector where there's sort of a significant sort of government-driven uh, subsidy or pattern is mm. it just gets built into the price. They are putting a cap on fees for the next year at least to, to stop that happening so they can only go up just over 4%. Well, that's still higher than inflation yeah. and in, higher than an inflation target. Um, we also need to remember that you know, higher wages does mean more spending from those people. So again, at the margin, the Reserve Bank will be thinking, well, that's a bit more demand from consumers, even though, you know, they're only a subset of consumers. It's not enough to sort of really move the dial on their forecast. But, you know, every, you know, the Reserve Bank does seem to be in a bit of a mindset at the moment that every single extra dollar of demand mm. uh, is a problem. And that's because they are so pessimistic about supply capacity. So they, they might not the Reserve Bank might not be cheering on these sorts of announcements. Probably not, given where where their thinking is on mm. supply capacity. Look, a final one, uh, Lucy Ellis. You're the first female chief economist of one of the big four banks, and you have spoken out before about not enough women studying economics. I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. What can be done to attract more women into your field? Well, this is something that the Reserve Bank's put a lot of thinking uh, into in their own education program and they're certainly doing a lot of things to make economics look more attractive uh, to both sexes. I do also just quickly want to point out I am the first female chief economist of a big four bank but I'm not the first female chief economist of any Australian bank. Oh, that indeed, was Westpac, Bess yeah. Yeah, that was Bess Adida at, um, at St George. So I uh, just want to, um, to pay tribute there. Uh, but in you know, coming back to this idea of how do we 
attract, yeah, and not just students of both sexes. It's also about the socioeconomic diversity. There are there are so many comprehensive high schools in Australia that don't even offer HSC economics. Uh, it's perceived as being harder to teach than business studies. Uh, there's been a long-term decline in studying economics at high school. That probably does feed into the pipeline of university students. Uh, not completely. I mean, sometimes we do find that... Um, People think they want to do one thing and then they realise that they really like economics and they, they switch. I mean, I certainly know a lot of young economists for whom that's the story. They didn't do it at high school. Um, but, you know, we probably do need to, you know, break some of those stereotypes about, you know, economists being, you know, to be honest, someone who just sort of gets on the TV and talks about what the Reserve Bank's going to do. I think we need to <laughs> mm. help people realise there are a lot of really deep questions, uh, interesting questions, that you do get a lot of opportunities to, you know, talk about real world issues. Well, uh, a wonderful role model that you are, Lucy Ellis. Uh, well said. Look, thanks so much for talking to us. I've really learnt quite a bit and appreciate your, uh, your insights. Thanks very much, David, and thanks for your kind words. And uh, if you've got any thoughts uh, or suggestions on this conversation or any uh, ideas for future podcast topics, please drop us a line at insiders at abc.net.au. We'll be talking a lot more about this on Sunday morning on the couch. Hope to see you then. Bye.